Hello and welcome to tutorial 6 where we're going to go through an overview of the fleet editor as well as building your first ship. One of my favourite parts of Nebulous Fleet Command is the ability to make your own ship and from that ship create your own fleets. By balancing the different resources that are available in game you can create a fleet that suits not only your playstyle but also the way that you want to engage the enemy. So let's jump in and have a look at the fleet editor. When you first open the fleet editor what you'll be presented with is what is on screen. A single frigate in your fleet and a number of open modules and ship stats down the left and right hand sides respectively. So if we go through the different elements of the editor we can start to understand how we build our ships and our fleets. Having a look at the top you'll see the ship card as well as its name and you have the ability to create a blueprint, duplicate a ship or remove it. You can add other ships either from a blank hull using the Sprinter, the Reigns, the Keystone, the Voxel, the Axford or the Solomon to bring them into your fleet from which you can build upon. Alternatively you can import a ship from a ship template that you've already created that you want to reuse. That'll come pre-filled which will allow you to modify an existing ship design to suit a new role. Down the left hand side you'll see the details and the, around the names of your ship which you can change, you can call them whatever you want or you can generate a name based on specific patterns from a word list within the game. You can also give your ships a call sign, something that is unique and special to you which the opponent's not going to see but will help you with your recognition. You can also give them various different hull numbers or you can accept whatever is auto generated for you. Here we can see that this is a Reigns class frigate and on the left hand side here we'll see mounting, compartment and module. And this organises the different components within your current ship. When you're in the damage control board in battle, the components you put in the mounting, compartment and module will match up with the filters shown in tutorial number 5. When you open mounting, compartment and module, you'll be able to see the various different component slots available to you within that heading. Here we can see under mounting, as I move my mouse over, the different components on the ship will highlight. As I move within 3D space and orientate the ship, zooming in or out, I can hover over to see where that component will go. Mounting is largely restricted to communications, electronic warfare, your sensors and all your weapons, both missiles, point defense, cannons or if your ship is able to spinal mounts. Compartments are related to your command each ship must have a combat information center, crew, damage control and then support components such as engineering, analysis annex and the gun plotting center as well as the bog magazine, the reinforced magazine Compartments are the only ones that can store ammunition. Modules contain your power, such as your reactor, as well as your main drive, providing movement and propulsion, your type of radar, as well as additional supporting components, such as radios and weapon support. If you remember from other tutorials where a component has a size, for example here, mount one is three, by 4 by 3 meters. A component that is of a smaller size can occupy that spot. Larger components, which if I show them all, will appear in yellow if they cannot fill a position. Here we see beam current being 8 by 5 by 8 is too big for mount 1 and therefore yellowed out. If I reset the show only fitting, allowing us only to see what components will fit within that mount. On the right hand side of the screen we can see the fleet statistics with how many ships are in our fleet and the total points cost as well as individual ship statistics. As we add components to our ship the ship statistics will change. Using these headings we'll be able to drill down and see what our ship is capable of including any modifiers both positive and negative. Before we start creating our first ship we have to understand resources. There are a few resources that limit the number of ships that we can create. 
Firstly, you can only have 10 ships in your fleet. So you can have 10 battleships or 10 corvettes or a mix or match depending on the point size that you agree to play with. The next is total points. To have a fair and even match, both players should bring roughly the same size or agree to a points limit, i.e. 3,000, 5,000, 9,000. Currently the community is playing around 3,000 points per player, which seems to be a balance between the amount that they can micro and gives each player a roughly equal chance within the game. The next two resources are ship specific, being manning and power. Manning is probably the easiest resource on the ship to manage. A hull will have a base manning assigned to it when it is first selected and added to the fleet. When a component is added, that will require manning. So here we'll add a cannon that will require eight crew and we'll add another one so that we go over our manning limit and we will be presented with a warning, not enough crew to operate all systems. That is easy enough to rectify by going to any compartment and looking for the berthing component. From here, we can see that the berthing component being one of the smallest, so potentially one of the last ones you should place, will provide an additional 27 crew. Here we've rectified our warning, and once again, we have enough crew to man the hull. Power, however, is a more difficult resource to manage within a ship, as the larger and more complex components, such as radar, communications, and rail guns will draw more power. By opening the resources tab under ship statistics, we can see how much power is consumed, both in a percentage as well as a number, and what is both providing power and consuming it. Each ship starts with a reactor, as well as a drive that will provide some power and be equipped with a radar which will consume some. Here we can see power management if I was to add in floodlight illuminators, which are power intensive. As I add more, we'll start to see the power be consumed and go over the limit. When you are drawing on more power than you can currently produce, your power indicator will go red and you'll receive a warning. As you build your fleet, this can be rectified in a number of ways. You can remove the component that's drawing on that power to put you under your power cap, or you can come down to your ship and add in small things such as reactor boosters, which will increase your power efficiency you can change the drive, which will allow you to produce more power to cover the difference. Some ships will have a large enough space in which you can add another power plant. On a frigate, that is impossible, as we would be replacing the drive and therefore the ship would go nowhere. But on your larger destroyers, light cruisers, heavy cruisers and battleships, the ability to add the additional power plants of the micro reactor or an additional reactor will greatly increase your power output. Finally, one of the other things you can add is a plant control center within engineering as it not only increases your power plant efficiency, but it also doesn't increase your radar signature. However, it does take up one of your damage control spots or other vital components. So that's a trade-off you have to consider. So with that in mind, we can now start to build our first ship. This won't be an optimized build or anything like that. Uh, it'll just be showing you what you can do with uh, shipbuilding within Nebulous Fleet Command. So first we'll come to mounting. We're gonna add in some weapons. Here we're definitely gonna take uh, one cannon so we can add some ammunition. Some missiles. Some point defense. We'll take some ripper's A's. And we'll also take one of the bullseye radars for fire control locks. So as you saw in tutorial two, you can group weapons together so that when you fire in a formation, grouped weapons with the same weapon grouping name will be able to fire and coordinate at the same time instead of having to select every cannon or every weapon individually. We can add in missiles. So selecting from the different missiles that are available to us. This launcher has 16, so we'll just go ahead and add 16. Like from tutorial number three, we can add in some repost point defense missiles. We can also in, add in some chaff. So we can enter in 10 of each for a maximum of 23 slots. And we can add a radar component. So each time we are, each time we put something in, we can select what component it goes in and we can zoom in and have a look where that is on our ship. Now note weapon placement and component placement is always important. 
this top cannon will be able to fire on a 360 degree arc whereas the bullseye radar will only be able to operate within the yellow dotted line noting elevation of course so if we wanted to determine how far how high the cannon could fire we can come into the mount selecting the weapon and we can see what the elevation limits so we can go up 70 degrees and down minus five Next, we're going to come into our compartments. Because we've added a cannon, we want to add in a magazine to store our ammunition. The first magazine is always free. The bulk magazine will always hold more. However, the reinforced magazine will take longer to destroy. If your magazines are destroyed, you'll have no ammo to shoot. So in this case, we'll pick our reinforced magazine, which we can add the same way we did with the missiles, what ammunition we wish to select and equip our ship with. So here, like in the other components, we can see what else is available. But here we'll just add in some HE shells. The radial wheel will start to fill up the more we put in. So every time we add, the points cost for the ship is going to go up. So every time you add more components, the individual ship, the ship costs will increase, as well as the fleet costs. Now we've seen the error from before, not enough crew. So in one of our compartments, we'll add in the berthing component so that we can uh, have enough crew to man our weapon systems. We can also add in some damage control. Here we'll put in a small DC locker for the one restore and it's two teams. And if we come down, we can have a look at what else is here. Because we have a cannon, we might have uh, reduced the spread by putting in a gun plotting center so that all our shots are a little bit closer and more likely to hit at longer range. We've still got not enough crew, so we'll actually swap that one out for another berthing. Like the DC lockers, the first one's always free. This one being the second one uh, means we have to pay for it. So now that we've completed our compartments, we can come down to our modules and finish off the ship. We'll always start with the power. So here we have the FR4800 reactor, and that will do for our purposes. We'll also come with a drive. Then you have different drives to select from. The base drive... A reinforced drive which has the same characteristics as the original however it is tougher and more less likely to be destroyed as well as specialty drives that will allow you to select different modifiers to your engines here what we'll do is we'll equip uh, the whiplash drive so we have faster speed at the expense of turn rate and angular thrust Finally, we can add in some weapon support. I'm happy with the sensor, so we'll leave the frontline radar there. Because again, we've got a cannon, I'm gonna reduce its reload time by 15% by installing the ammunition elevators. And the time it is able to traverse and elevate by 25%, whilst also decreasing its spread. So now we've completed our first ship. We can see that the manning is good. And if we come down to the resources, we're within power limitations. So with that, your first ship build is complete. We have a frigate that is able to engage other ships with its cannon, that is able to launch offensive missiles, as well as protect itself from incoming missiles, and be able to guide its weapon systems with a bullseye radar onto the enemy. It also has enough ammunition to continue to fire that main cannon, enough crew to man the ship, a DC locker to put out any fires and keep the ship in the fight, as well as a power source, a drive, and some modifiers that will help us in combat. Now, at the beginning, we explained about manning and the resources being power. However, we haven't gone through the rest of the stats, which we'll do now, as it was easier to understand once we've actually put something in there to look at. So firstly, hull. In the hull section, we can see what the points cost is for the ship. Each ship will start with an, a mass associated with that hull. And for every additional component that we add in, that will increase. So if we open up just another frigate for comparison, we can see that the original hull was 5095 tons, and it's now at 5100. Now, as we increase the mass of the ship, the acceleration time will increase. So the more weight we put on, the longer it takes to move. We also have armor thickness. You cannot modify this, and this takes into account the armor penetration of various rounds. 
component durability. Each component within this ship has a durability modifier of 5%. Now we can see down here in the integrity rating box, when we first started, this was down towards 1.25% uh, with red. So the more components we put within the ship, eventually the green bar will fill up to the maximum amount. And this changes per hull. And what this does is basically simulate, if I scroll out slightly, if a round comes through the front, say through the front maneuvering thrusters and the 812, if there's something in the way, that will take damage first. However, if there's nothing there, it'll continue on. In addition, we can see the base crew complement being 50 and the crew vulnerability. Now this, again, will change based on the hull. There is one ship modifier. So if we come down to the small DC locker, if we come up to uh, battle dressing stations, by equipping this, the crew vulnerability will go down by 30% to 42. So as we spoke about in the damage control tutorial, damage control is a dangerous task. Crew vulnerability means that they are 60% more likely to take damage and therefore you'll lose those repair teams quicker. Structural integrity and identification difficulty are tied to the hull and won't change. One thing to be aware of is radar signature. As you increase in certain components, your radar signature will go out. At the moment, this means that if you're within 3,783 meters, you'll be able to be spotted by enemies, radar, and intelligence gathering capabilities. We've spoken about hull, but as we've increased the crew complement, the crew is now broken down into gun crew, command, the damage control, and engineering, so that we have a bit of a breakdown to understand that. Later on, there is intent from the developer to make the manning a little bit more, uh, have an impact on the game, uh, but that's to be determined in the future. Next is propulsion. So as we swapped out the main drive uh, for the whiplash drive, we can see that our top speed has increased by 20%. So up to 26 meters per second from its original 22. Its linear thrust does not change. However, its acceleration has slightly increased. However, we've also taken hits to our angular thrust and our turn rate because we've gone with this drive. Now, this is something that is a fair trade-off because it's a small ship. It can turn a lot quicker than, say, a battleship. Whereas with a battleship, we may want to increase the turn rate so that we can bring our weapons to bear and sacrifice top speed. As our power is increased, we can once again get a breakdown. We're still only producing power from our main reactor and our whiplash drive. However, we're being consumed across a number of different uh, components. In our sensors, we can see all the details regarding our bullseye radar providing the target lock to the cannons, uh, as well as our missiles, and the frontline radar that it is equipped with. And we'll do a bit of an explanation on sensors in a later, later episode. Damage control gives us a quick summary. It tells us what we have, as well as how many repair teams and restores. If we had any modifiers, like we discussed in the damage control tutorial, this will be displayed here. We've stuck with the stock standard uh, antenna for this, this hull. However, there are options to add in other antennas in which will boost your power or act as backups. Finally, under weapons, we can see all the weapons as well as their modifiers. We haven't used any of our support components to buff our missiles. However, we have focused on our single cannon. We've reduced its spread down to 20 meters at 2.5 kilometers. And we've also increased, or sorry, decreased the reload time down to eight and a half seconds and turned its traversal rate for its weapons at 25 degrees and 24 degrees respectively, increasing those. So every time our cannon needs to find a new target, it'll traverse at a faster rate, bringing that weapon to bear in order to shoot quicker. It'll then reload quicker and at the other end, it's going to be able to hit a smaller target. One of the other things you can do is set your ships into initial formation so that when they deploy, they'll already be grouped within task groups together. You can go check that out within tutorial two, formations and grouping as to how to do that and some of the advantages and tips. One thing that I thought would be cool to do is to see all the different hulls that are currently within the game from smallest to largest and what they look like within the fleet editor. The Corvette, the smaller ship,
the frigate. The destroyer. The destroyer is unique as it has the spinal mounted weapon, either a laser or a railgun. The light cruiser. The heavy cruiser. And the battleship. Alright, well that's the end for this episode. I hope you've learnt something about building your first ship within the fleet editor so that you're ready for launch day. Uh, one thing I will do is put together a list of all the various components at the current point in time so that people can have a look and start to think about what they want to put on their ships uh, come February 11th.